nothing, nothing else for our hosts. Um, first of all, welcome those of you that have shown up. And um, this is our first talks evening in uh, Elm Singapore Meetup Group. We have uh, three talks lined up for you tonight. I will personally start up uh, by talking a bit about some of the fundamentals in Elm, or the things that I think are fundamental in Elm. Um, then we'll have Matthew talking about Elm tests, and testing in Elm. And finally, we'll uh, diverge to uh, Michael, who will uh, be talking about something that's a bit like Elm, but different in other aspects, which is PureScript, which is also an option for the front end if you are looking to use functional languages and some of the benefits that come with that. So looking very much forward to that. I don't know if anybody from ThoughtWorks are here, but thank you, ThoughtWorks, for hosting us. I think that's, that's really great. We had our very first meetup in, at ThoughtWorks in the small office across the street um, back in January. So, um, so this is good. Great. Let's, um, let's get started. If I can click the right button. So some fundamentals in Elm. My name is Matt. Uh, I uh, kicked off this meetup because I came from Ho Copenhagen, where I ran a, an Elm meetup, and I couldn't sort of move somewhere else and not do some Elm. And uh, I'm really curious to meet people who were interested in this kind of stuff. I'm not a front-end programmer myself. I work in back-end and DevOps, actually, so I write Python a lot. But, um, but this is a great getaway from, from that world. Um, so when Coming to um, when coming to Elm from imperative languages, so JavaScript, Python, Ruby, whatever, uh, <coughs> I found that there are some things that uh, takes a little time to get used to. Right? It's it's, it's a different way of thinking, and I'm uh, looking back. I can see that my thinking about those things have also changed. So initially, I thought types was one thing, and later I learned, you know, they are also other things, and, and um, it's interesting. And, and what I'm going to try to do in this talk is show you around some of those areas that I found unfamiliar, and give you a very short sort of glimpse into what it looks like in Elm, and then hopefully encourage you to go back and spend some time on these areas uh, to, um, to improve your understanding of Elm, but also other functional languages. So. Uh, the way I like to think of types in a very non-scientific way is that it's a way to talk about the shape of your data at runtime, but at compile time. That's where you have the talk. And the conversation you are having is with your compiler. right? So, um, <clears throat> so it forces you to think about, think about these things. And um, when I'm talking about types, you know, we have some of the basic types that we all feel comfortable with or know, we think we know at least. Uh, even if you've been doing assembly and C programming, you have some notion of, of these types. Um, and um, another picture I have in my head is that um, types are like the important pieces if you're doing a jigsaw puzzle. So when you're starting a jigsaw puzzle, I usually find, you know, the interesting parts of the picture first and try to do that, right? That's, so that, think of that as, as your types. That's, that's really what, you're, what I want you, the picture I want to, to give you. So, <clears throat> uh, but in, in, uh, in, in the languages we come from, types are sort of just a standalone thing. They denote maybe the machine representation of, of something or uh, simple things like, you know, uh, uh, these basic types are incompatible at runtime, but it won't help you until at runtime when you get the error that they are incompatible. But in languages like Elm, you can actually do more with types. You can take types and build other types from that. And in, uh, in Elm, there are a couple of types that let us provide collections of types. So list is the first one that comes to mind. Um, list is a type, and it's a type that collects types of identical, that are identical in shape, right? So um, here, so we can have a list of floats, so we can have a list of strings, very, very basic stuff. Um, there's another type that collects type in, in Elm, that's the tuple, um, which may be less familiar, uh, unless you are from Python, for example. Um, and type, a tuple is uh, a way of collecting types that are different in shape. So a little bit like a list, um, but with different, uh, a different shape. And then you have a record. Now, a record 
is also a way of collecting types of different uh, uh, shape, but you can name them. So uh, again, some people like to think of this a bit like an object in JavaScript or something else, but you know, that's not what we're talking about here. Now we're talking about the shape of something. So you are denoting that these things, like x, y, and labeled, belong together in some way, um, and I've also given them a name. Good. So from this sort of these examples, we're learning a little bit about Elm and how we represent types in Elm. And whenever you come across a, a single semicolon, it means something has type of. So everything to the right of the colon is the type signature. Um, and it describes the shape of the data that we're going to put it in this thing at one time. Um, types uh, in Elm also use capitalized words, so uppercase first letter. So that's a good way to recognize them. Now, beware, there are a couple of other things that also use capitalized words in Elm, but usually it's impossible to confuse them. At least the compiler will not get confused, but you might. Um, uh, another thing you can do with types in Elm is you can give them names, another name. Um, so uh, you use something called type alias, um, and here we are giving uh, a record of uh, two fields with an X and a Y of these types, the name point. Uh, or we can rename string to username to be more specific about our sp uh, particular usage of, of this type. Um, and sometimes we just need a placeholder um, for, for a type. Um, and placeholders look like this. A lowercase, usually a single letter, but it can be multiple letters. But if you find anything with a lowercase, it's a placeholder for a type. In this case, I'm actually using the Elm REPL. Elm REPL is like other REPLs, command line thing where you can execute some simple Elm code. Here I've just typed in an empty list, and the compiler tells me, ah, I can see it's a list, but actually I don't have any more information. So it's a list of something you haven't told me yet. We haven't agreed what's inside the list. But I'll place this A here as a indicator that something needs to go there before we have finished the conversation. Right? So these are known as type variables, and you'll see them around. And it's one of those areas that can be a little bit confusing when you start reading uh, larger chunks of, of on the code. Now, the next fundamental thing in Elm is functions. So coming from imperative languages, uh, at least I have a picture. I think a lot of us probably have this uh, idea that uh, functions, you know, we call them methods or we call them procedures or whatever, but they are the places where we uh, we do something, right? The thing of uh, so even if you're in an object-oriented language, you are using these method or functions to access some state or change some state or well maybe doing both at the same time um, or. Yeah, we might send an HTTP request or something, but we think of it constantly as something that now something is happening, and I might look in my debug and say, yes, it's happening, right? So, but in Elm and, and other functional languages, functions are just a way of transforming your data at one time from one type to another, or maybe the same type, but you're making some transformation on your data, and that's basically it. They actually don't do anything. Oh, of course, they do something, and later we'll figure out how they actually do something. But you know, mentally, uh, thinking about them as something that doesn't really do anything is, has helped me a lot in, in thinking about or learning Elm. Learning so here's an example from the standard library. So you have a string length function, um, takes a string, and returns the length of the string. But the interesting part here for us in this scenario is that it takes a string and returns an int. So it transforms the data, right? And we can actually ask the REPL, <laughs> we can just say, you know, let me just execute string length or give you that string length. And it says, hey, I can see that's a function. It takes a string and returns an int. So the REPL is actually a nice place to be to do some of these experiments on, on things and learning about the types of things. You can also think of the functions as, in our jigsaw analogy, as the other pieces. So the blue sky pieces that you, you know, or the things that you use the pieces you use to put together the important pieces of your puzzle. So in Elm, uh, we define functions like this. Totally straightforward. Name, hello, name of the parameter, equals, and then whatever the function should be. Uh, should be. Uh, in this case, we are saying hello string plus the string parameter, and that's fine. So, but the, what you need to notice coming from some of the languages I mentioned before is that there are no parentheses here, right? We don't use parentheses as a way of 
defining functions in the in the in the way that we do in some other languages. Calling functions is exactly the same thing. Name of the function, parameter. Boom. We've called the function and the rebel tells us, ah, I have a string. It's hello Tom of type string. Now there are different ways of, of uh, calling functions after each other and ensuring that uh, parameters are passed correctly and so on. And I'll just show you a couple here so you have seen it at least. So this is the this is not the function parentheses parameters in function. This is just a standard thing you learned in math in uh, you know fifth grade when you had to separate the plus you know the addition from the multiplication in the right way. So it just groups these two things and say execute hello on Paul and then execute string uh, on the result of that. Elm also has the pipe operator, which um, is known from F sharp, if anyone was in the .NET space, um, and other languages, um, which basically allows you to pipe the result of one function call to the next, etc. And you can actually also go the other way. And that may look a little strange, but in some scenarios, this actually makes things more readable. So if you come across it, it just means read from the right instead. Um, let me see if I am getting. Did I lose? Oh, oh there we go. So, oh, that's, oh, that was a little long. Sorry. Yeah, so here we are. Good. Um, So a thing that uh, can be unfamiliar too is the, this fact that functions don't have to be fully applied. I mean, you don't have to give a function all its parameters. Uh, you can do it sort of piecemeal. Um, so for example, let's look at the, another standard function in the string library, string repeat. It says here that it takes int, its first parameter, and then it takes string, and then it will return a string. Um, so what happens if we give it the first parameter uh, in some languages, this would cause an error, right? But here it just says, mm -hmm, all right, now I have another function. It takes a string and returns a string. And um, then we can give it the last uh, uh, parameter, and then it says, all right, now I know what to do. Here's your repeated string. It seems a little you know, uh, useless, maybe, <laughs> when you first see it. But it's important when you look at the code uh, and to be aware that you might not be looking at a function that has all its parameters. So you might actually be looking at a new function uh, in a certain place in the code. And it, becomes, it comes very handy in things where you want to apply functions to many things. So let's say we wanted to not apply string repeat five to a single string, but to a whole list of strings. Then we prepare the function, say string repeat five, and then we apply that new function to the whole list. Right? So, so something to be aware of. Um, good. So, uh, just a small slide here on type declaration. So far, we have seen sort of the REPL tell us, ah, this is of type this. Uh, you can also actively tell the compiler, ah, I want this thing to be of a certain type. Then you put the declaration in front of your function. Uh, still the same syntax, colon for type has type, and then you specify the list of, of uh, types that this particular function is, is using. And um, you now there's another example here, um, which, and it's actually, uh, uh, there are different uh, good talks on how this uh, works, but it's a way of, of having that conversation with the compiler, and sometimes you give it some input so that it can give you better input, right? Um, and this is one of them. And uh, these two talks both have some great examples of this, amongst other great, uh, it, it's a very good Elm talk, so I, I'll, you can look up the uh, links later. All right, so that was uh, types, and that was functions, both very fundamental to any sort of functional language, but also in, in Elm. Um, now, I left one type out when I talked about the basic types in Elm, and that's the union type. Um, it's a bit like a tuple. It's a bit like a record in the sense that it's a way of gathering uh, data of different shape under the same reference. So you want a reference to something, but it can be different things. Um, but there is a difference. Um, let's just digress and think about a scenario in the real world programming uh, life, right? You have uh, your program, you have some state, uh, 
depending on how well, if you are in sort of an imperative mode and not really modeling your, your thing, you might throw some Boolean flags at this and say, ah, right, I have a flag for authenticated or not authenticated. Um, uh, but I also have a username and I'll make the agreement with myself that when the flag is authenticated, then I can look the username up in the username. Um, so I know this, but I have no help in the language or the code to enforce this sort of connection. So uh, I will invariably end up in some place using the username, forgetting to check the authenticated. Right? So once I learn that, I, I quickly resort to another option. I say, ah, OK, I need to do something else. I need to put something in username so that I know that it's uninitialized, and I'll put a null or a none or something in there. And then I'll check both the authenticated and the user uh, null, and then I do something. Right? But Elm has uh, this unit type, uh, unit <coughs> union type that actually combines these two things in a way that will allow the compiler to help us uh, ensure that these states that we are talking about um, do not happen. Let's see if I can. Sorry, this is yeah. So here we don't have a jigsaw analogy, but if anybody knows Uno, uh, the card game you play with kids. There's a card in there that has, you know, it can be any color or any number. As long as you have it in your hand, it can be anything. But as soon as you put it on the table, you have to decide it's a red four. Boom. Right? That's a little bit like this, a union type. And when you talk about it in the compiler, it can be any of these things. But once you are at runtime, it will only have a specific uh, value or type, yeah, subtype. So let's try this out. We have a small uh, sort of, uh, we are doing some reporting. Uh, uh, um, set up for a, a small, what do you call it, shelter uh, for people come when they find uh, pets or animals. It's very small because they only take fish, fish, cats, dogs, and well, something that's not an animal. Uh, so this is a way to d define such a union type. Right? But then we realize that uh, when people come with the cats, uh, well, you know, they well, they give them names, right? So how do we put that? Uh, and then there's also a thing about the dogs. They can be you know, different sizes and it, how much food should we give them. So, um, sorry, waiting. So uh, um, we can actually model that by saying, OK, I have a type here that says, you know, it can be small, medium, or big. And then uh, we can redefine that or uh, have a different definition of animal where you know, it can be a fish. But when it's a cat, we also have a string representing its name. And uh, when it's a dog, we have both a string for the name and a size of, and so on. And then when we actually, uh, um, and this is how we would create a dog, Edifix that is small, um, if anybody knows Edifix. And then at runtime, um, we can actually look at these values. Um, in Elm, you use the case statement for, for destructuring these union types in a way so you can and do different things. But the interesting thing is that the dog's name is only valid here in the context of dog. You can't reference it when you would have a fish, right? So, so, and the compiler can tell you this already up front, way before you're at runtime. You are doing something wrong here if you think a fish has a name. So it will help us. It will also help us cover all bases. So if you have a place where you're not, you're adding a new uh, animal to this uh, list, it will tell you all the places in the code where you're actually doing something with this type and say, ah, you forgot to handle uh, reptiles, which you've just added. So a couple of, of small things to be aware of when you read uh, Elm code. Uh, the, um, the compiler generates some helper functions when you define types. So a little bit of syntactic sugar. So if you take this dog, which was how we instantiated the, the animal type before, and put it in the rebel, you'll see it's actually also a function. So, uh, and it's a function that creates this kind of, of type. Um, and we refer to this as a tagger, and you'll see that many places. Uh, it's a function, but has this popular name of being a tagger. Actual records that we talked about earlier, when you define a type alias for them, they also get a helper function. Um, in the same way, that can help you create this kind of, uh, um, of type. And you'll notice from the, uh, when you're reading code that this is used quite a bit. 
And this is a case where the functions are actually uppercase, right, or, or capitalized in the sense. So the, these are both the functions and type, and this can be a little bit confusing at the start, but once you get it, it's very straightforward. Um, these ones, records, are usually referred to as constructors. Good. Uh, an example of something that's uh, used a lot uh, in Elm are the error types, maybe, and result, both part of the core library, and they're, they're both defined with this union, uh, union type. Nothing mysterious about them at all. Right? They're just a way of, of representing different shapes of data. Again, go see this talk by Richard Feldman, Making Impossible States Impossible. It's all about the union uh, type and how to utilize that to model your, your data and have the compiler help you. Okay, I'll take a little bit. So, there's another fundamental, I'm not going to talk about it, pattern matching. Go there, if you've done Elixir, you know about it. It's a great thing, uh, study it. Good, so all these things sound fantastic, right? But ah, <laughs> I just want to make a, an application. How do I actually do that? It turns out that in Elm, uh, it's actually quite easy um, because Elm is, unlike some other languages, uh, very opinionated. It's 100% focused on making your life as a developer, mainstream developer, easy. It's focused on web application, not backend application, not something else. Um, so it has made some decisions, and one of those decisions uh, are, is to have this, what is popular called the Elm architecture, but it's, um, it's really, as I see it, a story about how your code interacts with the runtime, because Elm also has a runtime that it generates. So besides compiling your code to JavaScript, it also has a runtime that it, it uses to run your code. And that takes some of the, uh, the worries off your shoulders um, for when creating these applications. So jigsaw analogy again. Think of the, the Elm architecture as the, the edges of your puzzle, right? The thing that you hook everything up to. So the basic principles of uh, the Elm architecture is quite simple, actually. Uh, it revolves around single source of truth. That means state lives in one place, and it's actually the runtime that holds that state for you. It will give it to you when you need it, but otherwise it has the, the state for you. Unidirectional data flow, which you've heard from in, uh, probably other front-end uh, frameworks that try to practice this. I think uh, React is probably one of the most known ones. But it's all about you know, data flows one way through your programs, so you always know how that flow is and there's no sort of uh, sidestepping. The big difference here is that in Elm, it's enforced and the compiler helps you. Right, so there's no sort of stepping outside the bounds. Um, uh, this can be maybe a little bit unnerving when you start and you come from an area where you can always just reach out for some global thing or some other or just add an event handler here. Um, to not be able to do that, but once you get the whole idea and see all the, the benefits that come with it, you don't think too much about it anymore, I think. So the third part is that uh, the rendering in the browser using virtual DOM, as we know uh, from other frameworks, but uh, Elm has its own uh, virtual DOM render now, and it's quite optimized and, and performing quite well. Uh, and again, something that we leave to the runtime. So, here we are again. I assume there's a lot of Haskell code running in the background here. Okay, so how does this actually look, right? So, um, so this is a event flow blah blah, blah diagram. Uh, the first thing uh, that happens, so before Elm, there is JavaScript. There's just no way around it. That's the entry point to to the land of Elm, right? So we instantiate our Elm program. Could be something like the full screen. We have the option of passing in some initial values, and we hand it to the Elm runtime, which and the Elm runtime immediately calls out to a function in your code. Uh, an init function, and says, yeah, here's the initial values, please give me a model of your world, the state, the one true, one truth, what it's called, the, uh, <laughs> the one, um, yeah. So, and init passes that back, plus maybe an instruction to the runtime to say, hey, also do this for me, right? Um, but basically the runtime now hosts the state, and it immediately passes us on to a view function that can tell uh, the runtime to render some HTML, using its virtual DOM engine, 
And it also has another function called subscriptions, which is part of the standard interface between the runtime and your code, saying, you know what, is there anything you want to subscribe to? Any events? And it goes and does that for you. So, um, and that's it. As a, before, then things stop, nothing more happens, unless events from the outside come along, like somebody clicking on a button. Again, the cycle goes. Uh, now it doesn't call you init function because, well, we already did the init, so now there's an update, and update is the main sort of motor. But it does the same thing. You give, it gives, the runtime gives uh, your update function the latest state and expects you to return a new state or the same state if it's unchanged. Um, and then you can also pass along these commands for the runtime. Um, and then it goes and calls your view function, says, hey, I have a new state. Do you want to render something else? And subscription, say, hey, do you want some subscribe something else? Yeah. No, thank you, all right. And this actually goes on, right? Uh, events can come from other places. It could be that the HTTP request we fired off before is now returned, so the engine goes again, calling the update function, getting a new model, rendering the view based on this model, rendering su subscriptions based on this model, and that's it. That's Elm for you, right? Um, so all you have to do in your code written all this code, is just to attach it, give it to the runtime, and you do that with the main uh, function that you define, and you give it a program, and you give it a link to these four functions, and then you just fill in these functions, the init, takes the initial values, returns a, a model, we can read this now, right? update takes type variable, type variable, and returns something else, but we can see from the names that, ah, this is the state, and this is actually the uh, a message, it's actually a tagger function that you can, or the, oh sorry, the, the instantiation of a unit, union type. Yeah, so what has happened? Here's my state. Give me back uh, a new state and any instructions for me. Subscriptions, same way. View, it returns something, a different data type than view, of course, because this is about subscriptions, but it's the same thing. It's saying these subscriptions, oh, and when you do send me a subscription, please use these messages to alert me that um, that I have something from this subscription, and that's what comes in up here, right, in the update function. So that's it. You've, uh, you've completed the whole tool, and you know everything about Elm. Be aware there are some simpler versions of this program thing. I just wanted to show you the real one, the one that you're most likely going to use, but the others are just as valid if you don't need subscriptions or you don't need initial values. There are simpler versions there. So, Ending here with uh, a quote from Miles Davis about learning the basics, right? As a really spend some time on the basics, then you can forget about them and be really good at what you do. Um, but learn the basics first, right? So that's the that's it. Yep, we'll leave that for for later. So <laughs> any questions before we go to the next talk? How will you lay out? Ah. Yeah, that's always a good question. I don't think it's appropriate to answer in, in a very short time, and I don't have the, the final answer. It's, there are different ways, but there is starting to show up some, um, some bigger projects in the open source world that you can go and get inspired from, and there are different people in the community that has opinions about this, right? So in, in, in Paris uh, yeah, conference, yeah. There are some there's something coming in the late I mean Elm is still zero dot eighteen, so it's not sort of the magical one dot uh, yet. And so there are still things coming and the things that have been hinted about the next version is going in that direction of structure, right? Helping you build that initial structure uh, of your, your application. Any other questions? No? All right. Uh, so yeah. on that note, right, how stable is the language right now? It, it's very stable in that sense. <laughs> that, uh, so as in, 
There, if you learn it now, it's still good. To be honest, it's hard to answer, right? Because uh, Elm is uh, of the form, just like Python, that there is a single person that's sort of the main driver, the benevolent dictator model. Uh, so Evan could decide to change uh, things sort of drastically. But uh, he's, he's shown us that the goals of the language are long term. They're about catering for main, mainstream development. Um, and it's um, and about a coherent experience, right? Uh, so when people come and say, ah, can we get a change to help me with my problem? The answer will usually be maybe, but, but not now. Because the work that goes into ensuring that this coherence and the stability and the upgrade path, if it's a language thing, which probably be smaller things, is exists for people, right? So I don't know if that completely answers your question, but... but And because it's targeting mainstream, and we can see now that the, the, usually around conferences, people start talking about their projects in Elm. Right? More and more larger scale companies are using it. So, so I think we'll also that will be taken into account. I'm, I'm not expecting much, as um, Matthew says. There will be some tweaks, right, where they are optimizing the compiler, looking at things. Is anybody using this little strange feature that you can use Unicode in your code, for example? No, okay, maybe we should remove it and make things simpler. Um, so, all right, let's get to. Oh, huh? uh, in your experience working with Elm, did you have to interoperate with JavaScript code? Yes. And is it simple to interoperate? It's very well defined, right? So, in the sense that there are. There is one thing I should say about. Uh, one thing that's important to understand about Elm is Elm is opinionated, right? Yep. Elm has made some decisions, or, or even, or, but in, uh, in the form of Elm, there's been made some decisions about what is the best way to do some things, including interrupt. And it's usually based on a safe approach, as in it's easier to add than roll back things. So Elm does not have official sort of low-level kernel FFI to JavaScript, but there's an something called ports, which is where you send your data in and out in a safe, type-safe way. Uh, it restricts what you can send in and out, but it's flexible enough for you can do a lot of things before you actually need to uh, resort to other. Uh right. So instead of sending, instead of calling JavaScript functions to identify the data, you're sending data to the JavaScript functions. Yeah. Yeah. So you basically have a way, just like we saw with the subscriptions, right, of saying, you know, and that instead of calling a module that knows about subscribing to web sockets, it calls your code outside Elm and says, oh, okay, and you do whatever, and you can send things back in, and it will enter your update function. Yeah. And treat it. So how do we find next one here? It's a different window. It, yeah, it's a window that's preview. Let, so we basically are stuck to preview. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You, what do you say? You, you, t you take over and show us where, where it is. Um, I will let Matthew talk. Second presentation. Yes.